Today at the uh, BGICC conference, I was able to provide an update on the uh, new and emerging approaches to treatment of primary ovarian cancer adjuvant therapy. And we felt, we felt this was a good topic to bring up because uh, what we have witnessed in the last six years has been a, almost a revolution in how we approach this disease. Um, like many solid tumors, there's been incremental benefit with the addition of uh, standard therapies being used uh, uh, in combinations. And in ovarian cancer, uh, once we saw the introduction of uh, Paclitaxel in 1996 and Bevacizumab in 2011, uh, we really have seen um, a, uh, that this development space is, has been fairly stable. We've not been able to uh, in, impact it very much. But on the heels of that came uh, the understanding of how uh, the PARP inhibitors are now demonstrating uh, therapeutic efficacy as single agents and demonstrated therapeutic efficacy as maintenance agents in the recurrent ovarian, in the recurrent uh, uh, domain. So with those findings, it was very exciting for us to start to move those drugs into the frontline setting. And in 2018, uh, we had the presentation of Solo One, which was adopting Alaparib as a maintenance strategy for patients who had, who had achieved an objective response during frontline chemotherapy as a maintenance strategy. And what we saw was that this uh, enormous benefit uh, for uh, delay in progression for women who, uh, who were uh, enrolled into the trial with a germline mutation or a tissue-based mutation in BRCA1 or 2. Now, that was an important um, um, observation because the uh, absence of functioning BRCA in a tumor makes that tumor extremely vulnerable to double-strand breaks, which occur, uh, but it could be promoted by inhibition of PARP. So there's been a, uh, an observation that in cells that are deficient in BRC1 and 2, that in the presence of a PARP inhibitor, they're much more likely to be lethal uh, than uh, when they carry this BRC mutation than when they don't. So the, the combination of these two factors, uh, a, um, a, in, a, an underlying deficiency in BRCA with the combination of a PARP inhibitor, we were seeing efficacy uh, in this genomically annotated population. So that's really important. It is a biomarker that we can identify ahead of time so that we can I, match a patient to the treatment. So when we saw this effect and we were able to demonstrate its, its, its impact in frontline as a maintenance among the small group of patients, this is about 20% of our ovarian cancer newly diagnosed patient population, we were very excited. And of course, it, 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 it opened the door for multiple other trials. And so subsequently, now we've seen uh, three additional trials that have emerged on the scene to evaluating PARP inhibitors in the frontline setting. We have, we have uh, PALA-1, which uh, added Alaparib to Bevacizumab as a maintenance strategy. We have Prima, which evaluated Neraparib as a maintenance, studied in a, in a slightly higher risk patient population. And we have Velia, which is Viliparib, uh, at the PARP inhibitor, which was actually studied during chemotherapy as well as during maintenance treatment. And all of these trials essentially demonstrated efficacy for their primary endpoints of progression-free survival. Now, as part of this, uh, this analysis, we also learned that some cancers that do not carry a BRCA1 or 2 mutation are still vulnerable to a PARP inhibitor. And we think this mechanism happens through a deficiency of the homologous recombination pathway, but by other mechanisms. Uh, and there's all different ways that that could happen. But when you look at the patient population that is not BRCA, uh, that does not have a tumor in uh, a, a mutation in BRCA1 or 2, but has homologous recombination deficiency, we find that these PARP inhibitors work. And this was borne out by the trials. And this led to the expansion of uh, the patient population for whom a PARP inhibitor would be beneficial. So currently, the FDA has approved um, uh, Alaparib uh, for patients who carry a germline or a somatic mutation in BRCA. Nirapirib for all patients who have demonstrated a response to chemotherapy. And Alaparib and Bevacizumab 
for patients who had who had uh, who have at least homologous recombination deficiency, which can be defined by either the mutation in BRC12 or in wild type patients who have uh, uh, homologous recombination deficiency by a uh, uh, an approved test. So um, this has been very very exciting, um, and it's it's providing the footprint for which the future trials are starting to bring in the incorporation of not only antiangiogenesis inhibitors but also immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we have, we have four trials ongoing right now um, that are um, hoping to annotate this population even further so that we can see if we can improve the outcome for our patients by the adoption of one or more of these um, really promising uh, compounds. Mm -hmm.